What's up guys, Luke here, and today I'm gonna give you five tips on seabedding in Pot Limitoma. Now if you guys like this content, make sure you subscribe to my channel and give the video a thumbs up. And I would say without further ado, let's get right into it. Number one is something that has helped me a lot along the way. And that is that I have learned to first of all think about my range much more than to first of all think about my specific combination and how to play that hand. And the reason why this has helped me so much is because my overall range will often tell me something on how to play my specific combination and the overall range of my opponent. How does his range interact to the board and what effect does that have on my strategy? When you start thinking more about that instead of your specific hand, you will have a much easier time to make an efficient decision. Let me give you a very extreme example to illustrate this. You're in the small blind and you three bet against under the gun. You three bet a very tight range there and the flop comes down seven, six, five. Now on this board, in theory, you are supposed to check every hand in your range, even though every now and then you flop a straight or you flop a set or a two pair hand. And that is because your overall range is struggling so much on this board that you have to make sure to check everything in order for your checking range to become protected and to be able to fight back against your opponent's stabs. Now, once you know that, it doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter if you have a straight or a set or total air. You just end up checking and go from there. Now, when we look into this example, king five deuce, this is a single raised pot, cutoff versus small blind. We know that in theory on this board, the small blind's range is quite competitive. The small blind should have a good amount of kings. He should have a little bit more two pairs and sets than ours. And therefore he is in a slight advantage here, giving him reason to do some leading even. Now, once we know that, that the small blind's range is competitive to ours, we end up in a scenario where we cannot allow ourselves to do a lot of betting. That is because our opponent is so competitive and will, for example, check raise us quite aggressively. Now, once we know that in this scenario, in the cutoff, I would estimate, and I don't know the exact theoretical answer, that we're probably supposed to see bet between 30 and 40%. So not that often. And because I now know that, I also know that ace, queen, four, three, without a flush draw is probably quite close I would still think that I lean more towards betting, which is also what I ended up doing on this flop because I have nuttiness down the road and I have one diamond. It's very easy to see bet too frequently on a texture like this in a scenario where your opponent is quite competitive. So make sure to think about the nut advantage. Who has more of the best hands on a certain board? Who has more equity? In this scenario, equities are really competitive, I would say. And based on that, decide as a next step, where does your hand fit into? Does it make sense to check it? Does it make sense to bet it? And what are the additional reasonings for it? Secondly, what I learned along the way is that in position, you are able to see bet way more often than out of position in almost any scenario. And that is because out of position, you are in a much larger disadvantage. You always have to act first, which will put you in a informational disadvantage, right? Your opponent knows what you have done, but you don't know what your opponent will do because he has to act after you. Secondly, when you're out of position, you have to make sure that you are balanced with your range. You cannot allow yourself to bet all your really good hands because then what will happen is that your opponent in position has a very easy decision. He now knows that you don't have any strong hands anymore and he can just start stabbing a lot into you. So you have to be balanced, making sure that you bet some good hands and that you check some good hands in order to check raise them, but also check call some of them. So out of position, there are a lot more ways that make it challenging for you. And on top of that, when you're out of position, you have to deal with all these difficult turn and river transitions while having to act first. Because you have to act first, 
it's much more challenging to play a flushing turn, for example, on this board, or a straightening turn, or a pairing turn, because you don't know whether your opponent has improved. He has to act after you, and you don't know what he will do yet. So you are the one having to act first on all these difficult transitions, and you don't have the option to check back on them. So out of position, you have to be really careful by not c-betting too often. Talking about c-betting, that brings me to the third point of today's video, guys. And that is that you generally want to play a quite polarized strategy when you are the player in position, like me, for example, in this situation. Now, what polarized strategy means is that... When you look at all the hands that you can have in your range, you have some really good hands on the top. Those are the hands that you want to bet. You want to get value and build a pot. Now below those really good hands, you will find a lot of medium strong hands, right? And those medium strong hands, they don't necessarily want to bet. And the reason why medium strong hands don't want to bet is, first of all, they don't play much better once your opponent's range becomes tighter. Medium strong hands benefit a lot from keeping your opponent's range wide and having an equity edge versus the weakest part of your opponent's range, giving those weak hands a chance to bluff, for example. Now, on top of that, medium strong hands really hate to get check raised because they are so far behind the top of your opponent's range. And when you get check raised, you're in a really tough scenario, right? Because your opponent will have a lot of good hands, you will have some bluffs, and you will be put in this bluff catching scenario. And lastly, I think also really important to keep in mind when you have a medium strong hand is that when you have a hand that doesn't play great on the majority of turn and river runouts, then what you often want to do is you want to pot control so not inflate the size of the pot and get your potential value on turns or rivers. Because once you bet and get called, there are only a few turns and rivers where medium strong hands are capable of barreling again. And a very important principle to keep in mind is that most of the time the hands that you want to bet are hands that can deal well with a lot of difficult transitions. And that is often not the case with medium and strong hands. So make sure to keep that in mind. Bet your good hands, check back your medium strong hands. And then on top of that, you have your air. And with your air, you want to mix it up. You want to bet some if you have some blockers or some backup equity. And you want to check some of them to give up basically. And that is what we call a polarized strategy. So we bet our best hands. We bet some of our air. And then we check back the majority of our medium strong hands. On top of that, what can be helpful, I think, for a lot of players and something that I learned along the way is that you don't want to use a full pot bet sizing almost ever when the SBR or the stack to pot ratio is really high. Now, the stack to pot ratio basically refers to how much money is in the middle in relation to the stacks. So we have an $8 pot and we have roughly $100 in stacks for both players. And that is a stack to pot ratio of roughly 12.5. And when that is the case, you generally want to shy away from pot bet sizings. Now the reason why you don't want to use a pot bet sizing is because once you pot it becomes extremely expensive for you to bluff, right? Potting is something that allows you to deny a ton of equity against your opponent's range, but at the same time, it is really expensive. So denying equity, so forcing part of your opponent's range out of the pot basically, is something that is really helpful when the stack to pot ratio is quite shallow. But when that is not the case, you almost never want to use a pot bet sizing because it's so expensive to bluff. And also, it's really hard to get thin value when you go for a pot bet sizing, right? You make it quite easy for your opponent to have a decision. He can just fold out all his weak hands and the majority of his medium strong hands, and he can just continue with all his really strong hands that do really well versus your betting range. 
Now, on top of that, also when you use a pot bet sizing, it's quite difficult actually to get value from your best hands because you're simply forcing your opponent out of the pot with so many hands in his range that in a way you want him to continue with because you want to get value right if you have a great hand. So potting, something quite common that I see by a lot of recreational players in specific, but something that you want to shy away from quite a bit in high SPR situations. So rather go for like a three quarter pot bet sizing like I do or two thirds here, sometimes even half pot, that's also fine depending on the texture, but full pot is not really a thing. Also in theory, it's never being utilized in a really high SPR situations almost ever. So keep that in mind, simplify it to using a smaller sizing. And lastly, guys, before wrapping it up, no matter what you do in whatever situation, not only talking about seabedding, is that you have to come up with a logical reason yourself and understand the why of a certain play. There's absolutely no reason to blindly copy the strategy of a solver, for example, or of a poker friend, if you don't know the reasoning for doing it, or if you even haven't tried to understand the reasoning for doing it. Because by the end of the day, we're not computers, we are human beings with a human mind, and we have to come up with reasonings ourselves in game. Something that I do in this hand might also apply in a lot of other scenarios, and I understand the reason for betting here, and I understand that certain principles of batting here can also be applied on another board texture. It's not about the answer of this specific hand. It's about coming up with a logical reason of batting. And when I think about this scenario, I have no showdown value. I have a hand with a decent amount of additional equity. I have a diamond blocker. And all these things together lean me towards batting. I also unblock hands like Jack-Jack, 10-10. Nine, nine hands that are often a natural fault on a flop that is king high. So I think there are a lot of logical reasons for betting here. And even if this hand wouldn't be a pure theoretical bet, which is possible, I haven't looked it up. I think the bet is still fine. And the principle of thinking about why it's a bet make a lot of sense. Also keep in mind that it doesn't matter as much whether you play the flop correctly or not, if you don't have a good understanding or at least an ID of how you are going to play on turns and rivers. So you have to already think ahead of, hey, what am I going to do on a seven of hearts? Or if an ace rolls off? Or if I make a jack with an additional gutter? Am I going to bet or check? You have to think about these things and understand that your flop bet is only as good as you also have the understanding and the willingness to know how to play turns and rivers as a follow-up. If you know that this hand is a pure theoretical C bet on the flop, but you have no idea how to play the turn or the river, you're basically lost and the flop bet doesn't really matter. So keep in mind that it's all coming together as, as one game, pre-flop, flop, turn, river. Think about the entirety of the hand. Think about potential turn and river runouts and make your decision based on that. Okay, guys, that's going to be it for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Over and out. Catch you guys in the next one.